I'm going to talk to you today about browsers and about CSS and about how we can start to new, use all the new shiny stuff that is coming into CSS, perhaps earlier than we might think. So this is me and some of the places you might find me. I, I just picked up a, a tag for my badge out there, which you could write how many years you've been in the industry on, uh, which is 21 for me. So I actually predate CSS. I started building websites before CSS was a thing. So I've kind of grown up with these specifications. And I'm on the CSS working group now, so I get to help to kind of invent CSS, which is quite exciting. And I'm one of the few people who's there as an invited expert which means I don't work for a browser vendor. I'm not someone who is, is kind of, you know, working for Google or, or Mozilla and saying, well, this is how we want to do things in our browser. So I kind of see myself as being there as the voice of web developers. So I try and find out what web developers would like to have with CSS and then find out how we can help people do their jobs better. That's kind of what I want to do. And when I'm talking to people at conferences, I'm trying to find out what people are interested in so that I can feed that back to the working group. And I was here last year talking about grid layout. I've actually been talking about CSS grid layout for about five years. It was starting to get kind of embarrassing. Like I was sort of pushing some sort of CSS vaporware because it was not showing up in browsers from behind these flags. And we were waiting and waiting. And then three months ago uh, in March, this happened. And grid shipped into all of those browsers other than Edge at pretty much the same time. A massive spec that's taken about five years to a bit more to be worked on, landed in browsers and Edge are also updating their implementation. And so we've had three years, three months of this spec and this is the level of browser support that we've got. That's the global, that 63.92% is the global can I use figure um, a week or so ago. That rises if you add in the prefixed Microsoft version. So very, very quickly, new stuff lands in browsers and then gets into the hands of people who use our websites. Now, obviously, you do have to look at your particular website and the sort of people who use it because there's different audiences. However, it does show how quickly these evergreen browsers are getting these specs into the hands of people. So in this talk, I kind of wanted to cover a bunch of stuff and really the frequently asked questions I get about using Grid and using Grid in new browsers and how we can start to use it and other new features. And I wanted to very quickly just talk a little bit about what Grid is, in case you haven't really explored the spec yet, and why it's different to Flexbox, because people keep asking me this. And how do we actually get started using this in production now that we can? And then, well, what about those old browsers? How are we going to deal with those? Even if you have got, say, a 70% figure of grid support, that's still 30% of people today who aren't going to see your grid layout. And then finally, why isn't that browser over there giving me this shiny new thing? Why doesn't that happen and how can we help to improve that? So, I talk about grid and people on Twitter like to say to me, don't you know that we've got Flexbox? And yes, I know we've got Flexbox and these two specs are different things designed for different jobs and there's a, a quite a simple difference between them. Flexbox is for one dimensional layout. That's where you want to lay things out as a row or as a column, but not both at once. And if we look at this example, um, you can see as this, this resizes, the row on the bottom has got a different number of items and so it distributes space across the row. Every time you get a new row when you're working in rows with Flexbox, it's a brand new flex container. So space distribution happens in that container and so things don't line up very neatly. That's one dimensional layout. So here's grid, which is two dimensional. If we build the same example with grid layout, you can see that as the browser window gets smaller and wider and we get fewer or more items on the row, they stay lined up in their rows and their columns. So that's two dimensional. We've got things lined up in a row and a column at the same time. And to do that, we apply this to the container. That's all we need to do. We don't need to apply things to the item when we're working with grid layout. We're using the repeat syntax. We're autofilling columns that are a minimum of 200 pixels and a maximum of one FR. So the space gets distributed between them. 
And if you've used Flexbox to build a grid, you might be thinking, well, I, I can do that. I can do that with Flexbox because I can add percentage widths to my flex items or as a flex basis. And that really is the point at which you probably need grid. If you are restricting the flexibility of Flexbox, then that's probably because you're trying to do two-dimensional layout with it, and that's where grid layout would solve a lot of problems for you. That's what it's been designed for. Another way to look at it, if you're making a decision about, should I use grid, should I use Flexbox, is that Flexbox works from the content out, and grid works from the container in. Say you've got a bunch of things, and they're all different sizes of content, and all you want to do is just space them out. You'd like the browser to say, well, this is how much space I've got left over. I'm just going to space out my things. That's a good Flexbox use case. And perhaps you want some of those things to take up more space than other things. But again, you just want to go from that content size and just let them space out in proportion. Again, that's a really good Flexbox use case. You can do that here, giving a different flex factor to flex grow. Now, if we're working with grid, we'd be working from the container in. We're creating a grid. We're saying, this is how many columns, this is how many rows I've got. And I'm going to take my content, and it's going to have to fit into that grid. So here I'm creating a three-column track grid using the FR unit. That represents a fraction of the available space in the grid container. We don't add anything to the items. We just hand those to the grid. Uh, they're children, direct children of the grid. And they all lay out into those tracks. They lay out evenly. We can cause some of our tracks to take up more of the available space. So in this example, I've got three tracks. Two of them have two FR, and then one has one FR. So the available space there is split into five, and then it's shared out in proportion. And then when we look at our items now, you can see that we've got some that are taking up two times the space, and that happens right down the column because we're defining the grid and putting the items in. You know, one item isn't going to change the size of another. And I think the reason people are confused as to why we have grid layout at all is that it just works in a completely different way to anything else that we have. When we build a grid with any other layout method, we start with the item. We add sizing to an item and then say, hey, do we have room for another one next to me in the case of a floated layout or something like that? So we're adding sizing to the item and then we're sort of making the appearance of a grid by the fact that these things will sit next to each other. So in a sort of floated layout, we'll you know, float something and give it a width. And so if it's got sort of 33%, then we might be able to get three of those items next to each other. Um, the same with inline block layout. We need to give things a width so that we can have other things sat up next to them. And even in Flexbox, although we say display flex on the parent, if we want to try and do a grid layout with flex items, we need to somehow give them a width so that they don't stretch right across the layout. So grid is different. We do all of our grid creation on the parent. And the only other layout method, really, that does anything similar is multi-column layout, which very few people use because it's really buggy. Um, but that's kind of the only other layout method which is, is similar in, in a way to grid, that you do something on the parent and then it defines the tracks. So grid is all about the container. And once you know this, the decision of whether to choose a grid layout or a flex layout for your items becomes an awful lot easier. But really, there isn't any right or wrong. Uh, you know, you do what's best for your layout. And of course, with grid, there's a whole bunch of other stuff that you might then want to use, which would dictate that you wanted to use a grid layout. We can layer items because more than one thing can be in a grid cell. It gives you control of negative space. You've got rows. So you can say you want something to start in row three and leave space above it, and that's absolutely fine. Grid has methods such as the dense packing mode to backfill gaps in a tight packed grid. And also, because we're dealing with the container, Grid allows us to name lines and areas of the page and then position things against those lines or into those areas, which is really interesting and gives us very nice ways to create layout. So I'm going to have a quick look at that. <laughs> 
because I saw this article uh, the other day, sort of being tweeted around, and people say, oh, this is a really cool technique. And you can have a look at that online. Um, all of these slides and code and things will be online later. Um, so this technique is where you have a nice column of text, but then you've got images or so on in your blog, and you want them to span full width. And there's various hacky ways of doing that with existing layout methods. So this article essentially said this, just do this, some magic will occur, and you will have this layout. Uh, and I'm all about explaining magic. So I thought, you know, what's going on there? This is a really, really nice technique. And it's not, even as someone who spent a lot of time with a grid spec, it wasn't immediately obvious what he was doing and how he was getting this to work. And so I unpacked it and worked out what was going on um, and realized that actually some of this stuff was, was quite hidden away in the spec. And so I thought I'd explain it because it talks about this naming. So here's my markup. It's a simplified uh, version of what's in that example. So essentially we've got a container and we've just got three items inside, one of which has a class of full. That's gonna be our full width item. So we create a grid with three column tracks. And I'm then setting all of the direct children to start after grid column line two, and anything with a class of full will stretch right across the grid. So that's the grid with those line numbers. The first item goes into the center after line two. The second is full width, so it stretches right across. And the third um, goes into the center, like the first one. If we overlay those uh, numbers, you can see them there. But the example didn't use numbers, it used names. So now you need to know that you can name lines. And you name lines in the square brackets before or after the track. Remember, we're naming the lines, not the tracks here. And then we can just swap our line numbers for line names. So there's the grid. And the positioning works like this. But that still isn't quite the same as the example because the example looks more like this. It uses names full and main rather than specifying start and end lines. It's kind of like it's targeting the track or the tracks rather than the lines themselves. But line-based positioning always targets lines. It doesn't target tracks. We don't have a concept of that. We seem to be using line names that don't exist in the definition, don't exist in the grid definition. So to understand how that's working, you need to know something else about naming and grid layout. When you name lines with dash start and dash end for columns and rows, you get a named area of the main name used. So here I've named my lines at main start and main end for columns and rows, which gives me a named grid area called main. If those lines were named foo start and foo end, you'd get a, name, a main grid area called foo. And you can place things into it like this. So with code like this, you create the lines and then you can place the item with grid area into main. But actually, that's not what we want either because the example used grid column not grid area. And this is where I got very deep down into the spec and down this rabbit hole that I and found this in the spec. So if you specify row or column start as the name of a named area, so in our case that's main, then the start line will resolve the start edge of that area um, and the end will resolve to the end. So because we're using a shorthand grid column, we're only specifying the ident at the beginning, which means that the end will be the same which means that this is really this. So by using that name, you can just say grid column full or grid column main because you haven't specified an end line and it's a named, uh, a named ident. It'll just repeat it and use that for the end, which is pretty clever. It was a nice thing for that person to work out. And I thought, yeah, you know, let's, so I explained that and that's up on my blog as well, a sort of detailed explanation of that. Um, it's in the resource to this talk, and if you inspect the element using the Firefox grid inspector, which I would very, very much recommend you do, Firefox is the only browser that's got real grid tools baked into the dev tools. So if you're developing with grid, make sure you're using Firefox because you can inspect your grid and see these lines and see where things are. So you can see uh, that column start and column end both have full as a value. So 
that was a really quick fly through that, and do have a look at it later and play around with it. But what this shows us is that grid gives us these very powerful tools to control layout via the containing element, which Flexbox really does not, and certainly none of our legacy methods do. So we've got all these tools, and as you start to unpack how you can use them, we can solve an awful lot of problems. And I think we've probably just scratched the surface in terms of what people could be doing with grid layout. So back to Flexbox, use that if your content is just a row or a column. Use it if you want the size of items to dictate their layout. And use it if you want to distribute space. Consider grid if you want to control rows and columns at the same time. If you're adding widths to a flex item in order to make it line up, that's a good reason to be doing it. Um, but also, you know, if you want to do things like overlapping items, naming things, all the things that grid does that Flexbox doesn't. So that's why we have grid and a little bit of some of the things you could be doing with it. But let's have a look at some real sort of worked examples. Um, these are things I've been playing around with to redesign my own site, which is incredibly old and I really should do something with. And I thought, well, now grid's out there, I'll use grid layout for it. So I've been working in a pattern library, sort of playing with some examples, which I thought made quite nice examples for a talk because they're actually real things, the things I'm intending to put into production. And so my site's basically listings of things. So I started playing around with a bunch of little boxes and how we might lay that out because really it's just a list of talks I've given and podcasts I've been on and books and, and so on. So I sort of played around with these boxes and I thought well, I'd have a look at the, the top box there, that featured item box, which ideally would have an image underneath and then I'd layer some text over the top of it. So the markup for this is a wrapper with a class of box feature and inside we've got an image, the title and the content. And I'm going to use grid for this because I want to layer up that content. So that's the container we turn on grid with display grid and so immediately all the direct children become grid items. Grid gap creates a gap between those tracks and then we define column tracks with grid template columns and that repeat notation I've used creates six 1FR tracks. So that's that FR unit again, defining a fraction of the available space in the grid container. It's been created for grid layout because we needed a way to define sort of flexible tracks uh, inside the grid container. So you'll get the available space evenly distributed. Now, if you've got content in there that is wider, you'll notice that where it says featured item, that's at, they're not actually even tracks because we need to account for the content. It's actually available space that's distributed. In practice, if you have six 1FR unit tracks, then by the time you've laid everything out, they're quite likely to be equal um, because things will span numbers of tracks. But it doesn't actually mean um, e uh, six equal tracks because it's not sort of flawed from zero. So I'm using line-based positioning to stretch that image over the grid area. So from column line one to column line minus one, that's the first to last column line of the grid. And it's worth noting that grid respects writing mode. So I'm working in English, so column line one is on the left-hand side of, of the document and lines count up from there and they count for minus one from the right-hand side. So you can count back across the grid but if we were working in a right-to-left language, that would be reversed. So your right-hand line would be line one. We're also seeing a couple of things happening there. We've got the explicit grid, which is what you define with grid template columns or grid template rows. We also have a concept of the implicit grid. That's what grid creates if you put something outside of the defined grid. So if your content just creates more rows um, or you place something into a column that doesn't exist, Grid will cope with that, but it will create an implicit row or column track for you. So after doing that, again, I'm using the Firefox grid inspector. So that's why you can see lines on the grid. That's from Firefox, just so you can see the lines. And so you can see the image there is spanning those three row tracks and is spanning right across the grid. And the rest of the content is now pushed down and it's just displaying using the auto placement rules. It's just gonna display into grid cells until we do something with it. So let's do something with it. I'm going to position it using line-based placement into the same row and column tracks that the image occupies. So I'm layering stuff one over the other. 
which where we can see the tracks highlighted, you can see how that behaves. And you can see how the second auto-generated track is growing to take the content that's been placed into it. So this shows us that we can layer up items on the grid. As you'd expect, things that are lower down in the source will end up on top, just like if you're using absolute positioning. And as with absolute positioning, you can use Z-index to change the order of things. If you want to change the stack, you can do that just as you would with positioned items. So this little item shows us a whole bunch of the features of grid layout. We've used the FR units and repeat notation. You've seen how grid auto places items if we don't do anything with them. And we've covered the implicit and explicit grid. We've seen line-based positioning at work. You know that grid respects writing mode. And we've even used some of the box alignment properties to stretch that image. So that's quite a lot for a little box. So the other boxes in my listing are quite a bit simpler. They don't use grid themselves. Um, they're all sitting, though, in an overall grid layout. And here we're going to rely very much on the auto placement rules because I don't know how many items I'm going to have. Some of the pages might have a lot of items. I might actually start to load them in. Um, I don't know how many there'll be, though. So I want to use auto placement so I don't have to explicitly say, you know, item number five has to go after row line three. I want to let grid do that work. So now I'm going to create a 12 column flexible grid, again with the FR unit. And so this is what I want to get to. If I overlay the tracks, you can kind of see how things are positioned on that grid. Now, if I just declare that grid on the wrapper without doing anything, I'm going to get something like this. And this is grid doing its auto placement business. It's just trying to stuff everything into one cell of the grid. That's what it does. So we don't want that. We want to position some of these items and create some rules um, so that we don't end up with this behavior. So this is the top of my grid. I've got the title and then I've got that feature box that I worked on and I want to have those sat next to each other. So I'm using grid column and grid row just to set their position on the grid, which gives us this. So we're kind of getting there, but the items below are still stuffed into skinny little columns below. So I want grid to do this auto placement thing uh, and, and take some of the weight off me having to position things. And I don't know how many there are going to be. What I want to do is say that these items, when it comes across one of these items, it should allow it to span a few tracks of the grid. And so we can just do this with a shorthand. So we can set the start line to auto, which means put this on the line it would naturally go to in auto placement. Um, but then span four tracks. Uh, we could also do the same thing with just by setting the grid row end, because if you don't specify a start value, it's going to set it to auto anyway. So you could do it one of two ways. And then for the smaller boxes, maybe I'll just span three. And that really is all we need to do to create that layout. We define our grid on the container, items auto place into the grid, if we explicitly position items, they'll be dealt with first, so we can use line-based placement to put certain things in certain places, and then still have the auto-placement deal with as many items that show up. So that's cool. We can create a layout with, with very, very few rules, but that was just a flexible layout because they're flexible tracks, but it's not really responsive. It's going to get to a point where that's all going to get too skinny um, and it's not going to be easy to read. So because our layout has been defined there in CSS, we've just done that in, in grid, it makes it very easy to make changes. You can either change the grid definition, so you could say, oh, well, at, at a narrow breakpoint, I only want to have four tracks, or you can change the rules that apply to the items. Um, I think most of the sort of frameworks out there, um, things like Bootstrap and so on, have it so you have, like, you always have a 12 column grid, but you change how many um, tracks of that thing span. Um, so that's kind of the approach I'm going to take with this. I'm always going to have a 12 column grid, but sometimes those 12 columns are going to be really skinny, and so I'm going to want things to span more tracks. So here I am at, at a narrow breakpoint. I'm start with my title spanning right across the screen. And then as we get more screen real estate, I can just change where it's placed. I can change how many column tracks it spans. And with our auto-placed boxes, exactly the same. At narrow breakpoints, they could span six tracks. 
and then drop to four. And you could add as many of these breakpoints as you wanted, depending on the kind of layout that you had. And so here's a couple of examples. So at one breakpoint, I've got, I've got 12 columns. You can see I've got the grid inspector drawing my lines there. We've got 12 columns, but just how we place the items is changing. Um, sometimes they're narrower, and so we span more tracks. So that's all pretty nice. It's certainly very easy to start to create layouts with grid. And if we were in an ideal world where everybody had grid layout support and we didn't have to worry about anything else, this would be lovely. We could just play around, move things about, get layouts that we wanted, and, and that would be job done. And I think we'd all be you know, in the pub far quicker than we normally are. Um, but we don't live in an ideal world. I don't live in an ideal world. My own product has to support back to I9. I took that photograph. I was at a, tri a triathlon. I was setting my bike up and I turned around to look at the field that was behind me and there it was. The sort of IE steamroller. It's gonna make its way into many a presentation. I, uh, I quite like that. But this reality of old browsers, you know, it, it's not gonna go away overnight and actually it's never really gonna go away because there's always gonna be new stuff coming into CSS, we hope. Um, I'm hoping that we're gonna carry on making new stuff for CSS. And so it's never gonna be a case that something lands in a spec, is implemented in one browser and then, you know, immediately overnight shows up in every other browser and turns up on everyone's computer. It just doesn't work like that. So we always need to deal with older browsers and browsers that don't have support for certain things but you really don't need to build two layouts. Uh, you think with grid, people are saying, well, if you're gonna use grid, you'll have to build two layouts, two completely different layouts. It doesn't have to work like that. Grid works very well as an enhancement. And you know, it really does make sense to start using grid on new sites right now to a greater or lesser extent. And to be perfectly honest, it makes sense to start using any new CSS feature on new sites right now, because ultimately, Browsers are updating so quickly, these things you know, are being sort of grown into by the users of your site very, very quickly. And there's kind of three ways we might think about new features. So there are some things that are kind of easy to think about. They're a kind of visual enhancement that can be left to, you know, if, if the browser's got it or if it doesn't, it, it doesn't really matter. It's just like a little visual enhancement. Um, here's a good example of that with a different spec, CSS shapes. So we've got this shape spec that lets us curve text uh, around images and so on. It's really, really nice. You say shape outside, circle, and then if you've got support, you end up with the image there on the right where the text is curved around the image. That's really nice. But because it's applied to a float, if you don't have support, you just get the squared off view, which is what you would have got anyway. So you often see this on things like um, the uh, one on the right there is Chrome, the other one's Firefox. Firefox are currently updating, so at some point, people in Firefox will also see the nice shape. But it's not gonna really destroy anyone's experience um, if they don't get the shape. So it's kind of easy to think about using things like that and say, well, that's okay, that'll fall back and it won't be a problem. But if we look at the third approach, you're saying, my website needs to look identical in all browsers, whatever that means. But you know, if you think like that, then well, probably there's actually no point you trying to use grid layout because you are literally going to be building your site twice because you're gonna to have to do the full level of support and then you're going to only use the part of grid layout that other things can do because grid does stuff that you can't do other ways. You can't actually you know, make a floated layout work in the same way. So you'd have to, if you wanted an identical experience, say in IE9, as, as with your grid layout version, well, you probably couldn't do that and use all the features of grid. So maybe you're gonna have to say, well, no, I can't. I'm gonna have to limit everyone to this version of the site for IE9. However, I think for most people, there's a kind of middle ground there. A middle ground that lets you provide an experience, a good experience that meets the people where they are with the type of browser and technology that they have. You know, nobody is saying, oh, well, I'm not gonna use responsive design because the site will look different on mobile. That's not what people say. They're happy to make it look different for the capabilities of a mobile device. So sometimes it's okay to let things look different for the capabilities of an old version of IE, for instance. And the cool thing is that the specification has defined how grid works with older 
layout methods and Flexbox as well. Once a parent element becomes a grid container, a lot of the methods that you might have used to create a layout for older browsers essentially just stop having any effect, which is brilliant. So we'll go through a little bit of that in practice. So that's my listing page in a browser that doesn't support grid layout. Now, as you'd expect, everything is displayed in document flow. Now, if you're a really hard line, you might say, well, I don't mind, that's how it's gonna be for people with older browsers. I think most of us probably aren't in a situation where we would be happy to do that. So that listing, pretty easy to create a fallback layout for. We just need to pick an alternate way to display our boxes. So for me, I chose flex layout. So flex items, if I, have, if I have a parent and I say display flex, and then I say display grid, the flex items become grid items. Um, and then I can use a flex layout constraining the width by adding a um, percentage there as flex basis. And, and that will work reasonably well. But what I'm going to need to do is remove the margin I've added to the flex items because the grid gap property is gonna control the spacing in my grid layout. And to do this, I need to use something so that both sets of browsers don't interpret the margin. And for this, I'm going to use feature queries, which if you have ever used Modernizer, you'll like feature queries because they're like Modernizer baked right into your CSS. And if you've used a media query, you pretty much know how to use them. And feature queries have fantastic browser support. Anything new that lands in browsers from now on, you can use a feature query to detect it. And you don't need to worry about old browsers because what we do is we write our old layout and then we ask with the feature query, does the browser support the shiny new thing? And then we overwrite whatever it was in the old layout. And I'll show you an example of that. So feature queries test for property value. So we can say at supports, just like a media query, we say at supports, and then we say, for instance, for grid layout, you'd say display grid. But you could also look for a, any property, really. So if you knew a browser only supported a subset of properties inside a spec, well, you could just look for something very specific. Uh, interestingly, you can also use them to test for custom properties. Um, so if, if you chuck in a custom property and test for that, if that resolves true, then you know you're safe to use custom properties, CSS variables, uh, which is really useful as well. So if you go back to the design and see how that works in practice, um, use the fact that grid will be ignored by browsers that don't support it, and the fact that declaring display grid after display flex, the flex behavior will be overwritten. So then I just need to wrap that CSS that sets the margin back to zero in a feature query. So that's only gonna get applied if we know we have grid layout. So we end up with this layout. And the final thing I want to do is I want to make that title and the feature box have similar proportions to the grid layout, which I can do by just giving the box a larger flex basis. Again, I don't need to overwrite this. I don't need to sort of wrap anything in a feature query because as soon as that becomes a grid item, that's just gonna be ignored. And so we get something like this with a very, very tiny amount of kind of overwriting. We've got something which is probably pretty much okay. You could go a bit further than that. I could possibly tidy up the feature box, maybe by using absolute positioning, which wouldn't be as flexible, but kind of would work if I knew what the sort of content was going to be. Um, or I might leave it like that because then I know I'm not gonna have any problems with things overlapping. So what this shows, it is a very simple example, but it shows that you don't need a lot of CSS to overwrite things. And we've built that into the spec that if you have things that are using older me layout methods and then you use grid, they'll just be overwritten. And you can do this with pretty much anything you might use for layout. Float and clear, no effect on a grid item. As soon as you're in grid layout, that stuff is just nullified. Inline block, exactly the same. Things stop behaving like inline block items. For instance, the fact that um, they preserve white space, that will just go away the minute your inline block item becomes a grid item. Display table, that's a weird one because if you set something to be display table cell, you get these anonymous wrappers around the item. The minute that it is a grid item, we don't generate the anonymous boxes. You don't have to worry about those getting in, in your way. Things like vertical align that you might use with inline block layout and table layout. Vertical align takes no effect once something is a grid item. You don't need to do anything special. 
And even multi-call. I said no one uses multi-call. It's actually quite handy for certain grid layouts, particularly if you're just laying out sets of boxes. You can use multi-call. But if you've got something which uses those multi-column properties, like column count, once it becomes a grid layout, they just don't apply anymore. You'll not get a weird mixture of multi-call and grid. And with flex layout, it's very straightforward because flex items just become grid items, and so any flex properties stop taking effect. In practice, and what I'm finding in my own work, is that inside at support, what I'm getting is a big stack of selectors, and I'm setting widths back to auto, I'm removing margins, and that's pretty much all I'm actually doing inside the feature queries a lot of the time, is just tidying up the stuff that would be interpreted by both sets of browsers. Um, so just like this, really. Um, here we've got a floated layout, and I've, I've got a width of 33%. Um, I need to sort of get rid of that width because once we're in grid layout, it'll become 33% of the track. So inside the um, uh, feature query, I just set the width to auto and then we don't have a problem. That's a whole bunch of information and I've kind of wrapped it all up in this cheat sheet of fallbacks and overrides for grid. So when you're trying to do this stuff, you know how that works. But as I say, that's all defined actually in the specification itself. It's not a hack. It's not something weird that's going to change. You know, it's all written out there so we know that that's how browsers are going to behave with older and newer things. And finally, what of Edge and IE? Because it's something a bit interesting. The browser that currently, the modern browser that doesn't currently support modern grid layout is Edge. And before anyone starts Microsoft bashing, the only reason we have grid layout is because Microsoft shipped a version of it into IE10. But what that means is there is a version of grid layout in IE10, IE11, and Edge. It's just not modern grid layout, but it's pretty usable. It doesn't have all of the features, but you can do quite a lot with it as fallbacks. Um, Edge are updating. Uh, so they're going to have a new grid layout soon. Uh, so what's in Edge at the moment and what's in IE10 and 11? That's that original IE10 implementation. It's prefixed, MS prefixed. Um, you can pretty much use a lot of it. I wrote a post, which is linked there, um, just explaining what you can use. And it's, it's stable, it works pretty well. It'll certainly do you very nicely as a fallback for those browsers. If you're doing that, if you wanna make sure things work in IE, make sure auto prefix, if you use it, is updated and that it is not um, chucking in prefixed grid because it will break things. Um, and Greg Whitworth from Microsoft wrote up how to use feature queries to make sure that you're isolating future edge that will support real grid and old edge and IE which will support the old grid. So that's worth having a look at. So just as I'm sort of wrapping up, we go back to this slide. All of those browsers suddenly supported grid layout and Edge is getting there. You know, how does that happen? How do we get to a point that browsers choose to implement features? And what do you do about those browsers that aren't implementing a certain feature? We as the web community have so much more sort of possibilities to influence this process than we might think. If you want certain features, especially things that are already in one browser and aren't in another, make sure you let the browser vendors know that you want them. Some of them have places, like Edge has got their user voice, where you can actually go and vote for features. Please do. The reason that they you know, prioritized grid layout updates was because you know, the web community started going and voting like mad on those features and saying, we want it, we want it. So do that, go and let them know. Write about those features. Um, pretty often in the working group, people are saying, oh, is anyone actually using this? And we're all just Googling and seeing, is anyone using it? Is anyone writing about it? Is there any excitement about that feature? So if you write a blog post about it, if you talk about it at Meetup, we're probably gonna see that, as will the browser vendors, when they're thinking about, is this something that web developers want to use? It's also worth using stuff on your site um, maybe on a personal site if you feel like you can't put something out onto a, a sort of a production commercial site because the browsers are investigating which features are in use actually out there on the web. So if you're a browser vendor and you don't support a certain feature, you might be looking, oh yeah, a lot of people are using that. It's in Firefox and quite a few people have started to use it already. They're actually interrogating the web data to find out which features we're using. So it's actually really worth using, when you can, new features, even if you don't think most of your users are going to see that feature. Um, it may well just add to the support out there because browsers will start thinking, well, we need to implement that. 
So very quickly, while, while I'm here, this is my latest thing that I would really like more people to support. This is CSS exclusions. It was removed from the shape spec. It defines a property that lets us wrap content around all sides of an item. Uh, the original name, sort of way back when, was positioned floats. You can kind of see why. It's a bit like a floated item where you can wrap stuff all around the outside. Um, you need to use Edge to see this. It's only implemented in a Microsoft browser. This is all you do. You position um, the item with some method, maybe with grid layout, and then you just say wrap flow both. So content, please wrap around this item. As I say, it is only in Edge. Um, Chrome platform status says, oh, there aren't any signals from web developers. No one wants this. I'm pretty sure we could change that because I think it'd be really quite useful to be able to wrap text around all sides of items rather than having things that are floated and it only being sort of uh, top and right. So this is the sort of thing, if you find something, you know, in, in the platform, you think, I'd love to have that. I'd love to be able to use that on sites. Talk about it, because it really does make a difference, because there are so few people actually really promoting new features. You can also get involved in the future of CSS. Uh, you don't need to be part of the CSS working group to influence what comes into a CSS spec. Um, if you find things, say, in Grid, you can come and you can comment on the uh, CSS working group draft repository, search the issue, issues raised against spec, add your use cases. We'd really like to see them. Um, that's going to help us work out what we put into level two of the grid spec. You know, what do people actually want? What problems are we not yet solving? Um, we'd love to be able to add your thoughts. Um, this is the thoughts of people about we'd like to be able to maybe style backgrounds and borders of actual grid areas and cells themselves. So that's an issue on there. And there's lots of people commenting on that, some of whom are working group members, some of whom are not. So please do get involved with the specs. Um, there's some ways you can do that. You can raise bugs against browsers, you know, come and talk to people at the working group, come and raise issues on the repository. It's really important. Um, you know, this is your language that you're using. So you make sure that you take the opportunities to feedback. That was a really quick fly through all of this stuff and I've made a whole bunch of resources here. Gridbyexample.com is where I put all of my grid stuff. I wrote all the guides from Mozilla Developer Network on MDN and there's loads of stuff on my personal website. Um, I'm doing a sort of meet the experts thing later on this afternoon. If you've got grid questions, layout questions, questions about the CSS working group or anything else that I might know about, come and talk to me then. And the resources and all the code are at that URL. Thank you very much for listening.